Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Join today. Hello, and welcome to today's Commonwealth Club program. My name is Clara Jeffrey. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Mother Jones and today's moderator. As the club continues to hold virtual events during the pandemic, they're also grateful for your continued support. Visit the commonwealthclub.org to learn more about membership or to support the club right now with a tax-deductible gift by clicking the blue donate button on your screen. The club would also like to thank the Bernard Osher Foundation for supporting today's Good Lit event. It's my pleasure to welcome Jake Tapper. He's the anchor and chief Washington correspondent at CNN, where he hosts both a weekday show and a Sunday show. He's also the author of a new novel, The Devil May Dance. It's a sequel to his bestseller, The Hellfire Club, which is being adapted into a TV series by HBO Max. We're going to talk about historical fiction, but also about politics and media. So if you have a question for Jake, please put it in the chat. Jake, um, welcome. Good to see you again. Good to see um, you. It's been a long time since I saw your face. Uh, very long time. Um, you know, a lot of the things that we're going to discuss today are sort of an interesting Venn diagram between truth, lies, and fiction. So let me start off by asking you about some news you made uh, a few days ago when you told Kara Swisher of the New York Times that um, Republicans who push the election fraud conspiracies are not welcome on your show. And you estimated that's about a third of the caucus, which, to be honest, seems low. No, no, um, no. It's two thirds of the House caucus. Two thirds of the House caucus. All right. Um, in any case, how did you arrive at this decision? Well, to be completely candid, um, it's not a decision and it's not a policy. Uh, it's I, I, I haven't booked any of the liars since the election. And I um, just started recently in the last few weeks talking publicly about it. Um, it's not a policy. I mean, if if uh, if one of them wanted to come on the show, uh, I would talk about it with my team and I would want to talk about the election lies, obviously, not just as a throwaway at the end. But at, as a focus, I respect that there are other people who do it differently who think that the way to do it is to press them on the lies, et cetera. Although I haven't really seen a tremendous amount of interviews like that, but my, so just to be clear, it's not a policy. And if people, uh, it, it, I, I just think that we in the media need to be having the conversation. And since, uh, I pretty much <laughs> alone haven't booked any of these people, um, I started talking about it publicly because people started noticing it and I didn't want to be coy about it. I have real misgivings about it. Um, and I think that there, I think it's important to book Republicans and I think it's important to book conservatives. And um, I just had Congressman Mike McCall, the uh, chief um, Republican on the house foreign affairs committee on, on my show today to talk about his view of Biden and Russia. And I, th I think that's important. I, 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 you know, I, but the election lies are not a difference about tax policy. It's not a personal, personally different, you know, uh, disagreement about a social issue. The election lies are lies. It's no less true than saying, I mean, no, no less a lie than saying that the, the, the moon landing was faked or, uh, that the Holocaust didn't happen, or uh, I mean, th these are just these are or, or that um, or QAnon, or that Bush knew about 9/11 and let it happen. Uh, you know, these are these are offensive ideas, and generally speaking, society treats them as such. This one was offensive from the very beginning. And and the re and the reason was, you know, when Trump it's Trump started lying about this before the election, he started setting the stage for it when it was obvious what was going to happen, that 
um, Biden could very well win, according to the polls, and that it was going to be a close election, especially in some states, and that Democrats were using absentee ballots, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but we all feared. I mean, the reason why we all feared about this, I don't care if it, you know, I don't care if Donald Trump hurts Joe Biden's feelings. That, that doesn't that's not what's at stake here. What's at stake here is. Violence. And, um, you know, Gabe uh, uh, Sterling, the, the Georgia Republican election official, very conservative Republican in December, early December, I think December 6, in fact, was warning about this. He was saying someone's going to get killed. He was worried about his election workers who were getting death threats because of the lies that Trump was saying. Uh, and then uh, a month later was the insurrection. So, yeah, it turned out we had to worry about Mike Pence as well. Yeah. Hang Mike Pence. And we, we we had to worry about Mitt Romney. We, we've seen the video now of Mitt Romney running down the hall. I mean, who knows what would have happened? Look, people lost their lives that day. And, and there are lots of brave Capitol and Capitol police officers and metropolitan D.C. police officers who who have PTSD, who are, who are shell shocked, who are who are some of them are wounded, maimed for life. But the truth is, we're lucky that more people didn't die. Um, four people who were part of the mob died. Officer Sicknick died afterwards. We're, you know, we're still not sure why his family thinks that it had to do with that day, but the medical examiner couldn't find any evidence of that. Two police officers died by suicide in the days after. I mean, there's a body count. This is what people were worried about. And so I think that it is uh, incredibly uh, derelict for journalists while it is easier it is derelict for journalists just to pick up and move on. So Chris Wallace was one of those who, when asked about this, um, you say it's not a policy, but a, a history thus far, yeah. um, he, he characterized it as moral posturing um, and, and said that the way to deal with this kind of a thing is to have them on and grill them about it. You, you say that you're not seeing that much of it. And I wonder why you think that is, is it, is it a format issue? Is it a moral courage issue? What, what do you did diagnose the problem to be? Um, it is not fun. It is not easy. It subjects you to attacks from Republicans. Uh, because Donald Trump so successfully convinced uh, so many millions of Americans that facts uh, are a partisan issue. Uh, it, you know, there's a whole there's a whole group of people like the Elise Stefanics and the Josh Hawleys of the world that will attack you for standing up for the facts about the election. And I can't speak to why other people don't. I can just say. I have yet to see Kevin McCarthy or Elise Stefanik or or uh, Steve Scalise or Josh Hawley or Ted Cruz, who I would consider to be the five, uh, the five basically who kind of led this effort. Like if it's, it's Stefanik is a new addition to the House leadership, but she certainly was a willing participant. And that's why she's in the position she's in now. She's more liberal than Liz Cheney. She voted with Trump less often than Liz Cheney. She just happens to be with Trump on this on the lie. So th the question is, um, have any of them been held to account for their election lies? For Kevin McCarthy saying right after the election that Donald Trump won the election in a landslide. For for Steve Scalise signing out signing on to that truly deranged Texas Attorney General lawsuit that tried to disenfranchise four states just cancel their electoral votes. And it's, I mean, I don't know how many of the people who signed on to it. And it's about, I don't know, I think it's about 130, 140 members of the House Republican Caucus. So I don't know how many of them read it, but it's crazy. It's cr like, it's crazy stuff in there. It's not just like, you can be, like, there's a difference between being critical. I don't like how states changed their election laws and played fast and loose because we were in the middle of a pandemic. Like there's, there's a way to do that. And then there's a way to, which I, I think I could understand somebody having, uh, making a, a, an argument like that. Mm -hmm. 
that's not to me election lying. I have concerns about how that was done. Like, you're not saying that Joe Biden's illegitimate. You just don't like how states did that because of the pandemic. But this is crazy stuff. I haven't seen any of one of these five grilled at all, at, at all, literally at all by this. Have you? I mean, I'm happy to say I'm happy to correct myself, but I haven't seen any one of those five be really ask tough questions over and over in an interview about this. I, I wonder what you would say to this theory that I'm going to put out that um, historically politicians go on cable news shows, Sunday shows, radio interviews to spin something to, or to put out their positions, whatever that is. And so now when confronted with, you know, lies and just bizarrely deranged theories that they're putting forth that it's very hard for the sort of apparatus around producing these shows to adjust. You're an exception. And I wonder even within your own network, how that's being received. I mean, I'm, I'm given the, um, you know, the, the leeway to, to do what I want to do. Um, I don't, and look, everybody has different ways of doing it. There are many anchors for whom I have tremendous respect who are doing it differently. Um, and you know, maybe, maybe they think all you need to do is have the person on, ask a few questions about whatever the issue of the day is. And God knows there are important issues of the day that we need to be talking about with not only Democrats, but Republicans, um, for what it is that we do at CNN. Uh, and then they ask a few questions and, you know, I, and they think that that's good enough. And I don't I'm not saying that I have the answers on this. I don't know. I am just saying as genuinely as, as I can at, at that I am I am. And it would be much easier if I did not feel this way. It would much be, be much easier to book the shows. It would it's much more it's much easier to get along to go along in Washington, D.C., it's there are there are people who went along with this lie that I liked that I had had on my that you know that I have had on my shows before to talk about important issues, um, but I can't get behind it. If one if one of these people said I made a mistake, I shouldn't have done that, I shouldn't have signed on to that lawsuit, I shouldn't have voted to disenfranchise the millions of legal voters who cast their ballots in Arizona and, and Pennsylvania. I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have told those lies or whatever. I honestly would say, okay. And then I would be able to, I honestly would then book that person. I really would. I, I don't want, it's not fun. This really kind of sucks. Um, it makes it tougher to book the show. And uh, it's not like there's a lot of people like, saying, yeah, I think that that's a good example that Tapper kid's doing. I guess no one's calling, I guess no one's calling me a kid anymore anyway. But yeah, I'm going to follow that guy's lead. That's a good, they're not. And that's okay. But I just, this is just how I feel. And again, it's, it's not a policy. I'm not saying I'm never going to do it. I am just saying right now in June 2021, I feel really uncomfortable about the idea of just letting these folks walk away from this as if what happened in January 6th didn't happen as if they as if they played no role. And also listen to Liz Cheney. Listen to what she's saying. She is very clearly saying, although I'm going to say it more clearly than she does, because she's she's got it. I mean, she's already it's tough what she's going through. She is saying they tried to steal the election once. They're going to try to do it again. That's what she's saying very clearly at great professional cost. She lost her leadership position. She may never be elected president. She might lose her house seat at great professional cost. She has done this. And I'm sure she's getting death threats like crazy. And I'm sure it's not fun to be in Wyoming for her. Yeah, I would imagine. Um, so we, we've touched on lies. We'll come back to more lies. But um, I, I just wanted to ask you a, a sort of professional jealousy question, I guess. You know, you're the lead acre of CNN. You have two shows. You had to be on hand for all the craziness that was, you know, on call for whatever 2020 threw at us and, and early 21, you have two kids. How in hell did you <laughs> find the time to write this book? Well, first of all, I have an incredibly supportive spouse. So that's, you know, really important. 
And my kids are old enough now that the time they're 11 and 13, that they want to spend time with me, but they don't want to spend all too time. much time with me, you know? <laughs> yeah. yeah so, I'm familiar. Yeah. You know, so, but I will say this, I mean, you know, I wrote this, this book in about, it took about two and a half years. So it wasn't like it just happened. Um, but I will say that first of all, uh, the, I find the outlining process very helpful when it comes to writing, because then you can just, it's like, a, I'm, I'm the kind of person that I get, I just, I, I got signed up for all these committees for, I went to Dartmouth for Dartmouth. I'm on all these committees. And for me, honestly, like, I don't, I just, just give me a list of five things to do. That's what I want. You know what I mean? Just, that's what I would prefer as opposed to the committees. And, but uh, an outline is like a list of it's, it's like a, this is what you need to do. And so for example, like I'll, you know, okay, I'm on chapter 13 today. Here is what it says in the outline to write. And like, then I'll do that. So that helps. And then the writing program is like a diet or like uh, an exercise routine or anything like that. You just have to make a rule and stick to it as much as you can. And for me, the rule is try to sit down every day and write, even if it's just for a minimum of 15 minutes, because because anybody can find 15 minutes in their day over breakfast, lunch, dinner, right before you go to bed, whatever. And if all you do is 15 minutes a day for a week, that's an hour, 45 minutes, that's three or four pages and it adds up. So that's really the rule. But I'm, I will also say that I wrote a lot of this during the pandemic and as excruciating and awful a time it was for all of Americans and all everybody worldwide. And as tough as it was for journalists too, because we had to, like, we couldn't turn, look away. We had to stay abreast of everything. I did the show from my house from, from April to August. And I found myself with a lot more time than I'd ever had in my life. So you're making the case for remote work. Well, the, the lack of commute is the key to a novel. I mean, I, I think that's reasonable. The hour and a half, two hours of commute gone. The I won't. I'm not going to say that there's a lot of time spent in the office that's wasted, but there's a lot of time spent in the office that's wasted. I think we. I think anybody who's ever worked in an office knows that there's a degree of hanging out time and meetings time. And there was something about the pandemic that made meetings, at least for me, and I hate meetings. Uh, the, I had far fewer meetings. No birthday parties. I had to pop by in the in the kitchen. I had more time on my hands. I really did. And I had a, a desire to escape the reality of what we all went through by spending uh, an hour, you know, with the rat pack in my brain. It's interesting. I, I was just about to ask you, the first book was sent, set in DC in the McCarthy era. And, you know, your, your protagonists um, are the same in both book, this couple, Charlie and Margaret. Martyr. Um, but what made you choose to set this book in, you know, Vegas and Hollywood in 62? It, it honestly was just, um, I heard this amazing story and I heard it right around the time that uh, I realized that the book, the people were buying the first book, the Hellfire Club, and that I was going to, if I wanted to, I was going to be able to write a second one. And I just heard this amazing true story, which is something so amazing. I don't think I could have ever concocted it, which is so Sinatra, which I'm sure you're, you're the attendees tonight. know, was one of the biggest stars in the world and the Rat Pack, which were his best friends who were also the biggest stars in the world. And it, it's hard to explain to younger people the best way I can explain it. And this falls short too, because this isn't even like a good, this is maybe like a millennial reference, definitely not Gen Z, but the Rat Pack was so big that they made a really the, they made a really crappy movie called Ocean's Eleven and everybody saw it. I and mean, it's not a good movie. It's really awful. It was just so they could go hang out in Las Vegas and, and screw around. Um, not that they needed a reason anyway. But, yeah. <laughs> but the remake of Ocean's Eleven by Soderbergh is, you know, like almost everything Soderbergh does, just absolutely brilliant. And it stars the biggest stars of its time, George Clooney and Brad Pitt and Matt Damon and Don Cheadle and, you know, uh, Julia Roberts, you know, there's just a ton. And what you have to understand about the Rat Pack is imagine if all those guys, Clooney and Damon and all, imagine, and Brad Pitt, imagine if they could all sing as well as act and imagine that they're all best friends. Like that's what the Rat Pack was like, this just incredible constellation of stars. So anyway, they worked their hearts out to get 
Senator John F. Kennedy elected in 1960 and thought not crazy, not, not insanely at all that when uh, Sinatra thought that when the president Kennedy would, would come stay with him when he came out to California. I mean, they, the Rat Pack did a lot for him and it was a very narrow election. And also a member of the Rat Pack was married to Kennedy's sister. Uh, Peter Lawford was married to, to Patricia Kennedy. So he started having all this work done to his estate, to the compound in Rancho Mirage right near Palm Springs. It's about two hours. Well, you guys know it's about two hours outside of LA. So um, he like he had rooms put in, he had phone lines installed, he had a helipad constructed. This is this is I didn't make this up. This is this all happened. And then Attorney General Robert Kennedy, who was going after organized crime, it was pointed out to him and he hated organized crime. I mean, he 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 worked against it when he was a Senate staffer and there was a famous showdown he had with Sam Giancana, the Chicago mob boss, where Sam Giancana was taking the fifth and giggling and then just Senate aide Robert Kennedy, I guess he was the chief Democratic counsel, said something like, are you giggling, Mr. Giancana? I thought only little girls giggled, Mr. Giancana, or something like that. Anyway, he hated Sam Giancana. Anyway, it's pointed out to him when he's attorney general, I mean, I think he was like 36 or something. Um, you know, Sinatra, who's friends with your brother, the president, is friends with Giancana, right? So I don't, can you really let your brother stay at Sinatra's house? So Kennedy had this, Robert Kennedy had this dilemma. Do I insult one of the biggest stars in the world, a friend of my brother's who helped get my brother elected through ways known and secret, or do I let my brother sleep in a bed where mobsters have slept? So when I heard that story, I'm like, first of all, I said, how have I never heard this story before? I mean, it just, I don't know how I made it to whatever age I was, uh, late forties, early fifties. And I had never heard that story before. And then I said, well, I need to have Charlie and Margaret go into that because that's just amazing as it is. And I can keep playing with the Kennedys and now I can add the Rat Pack and it just sounds fun. I mean, it was a lot of work too, but it sounded, it just seemed like it would be fun. What was the, what was the funnest part to research? I mean, you, you get into the mob, you get into the Rat Pack, you get into the Scientologists. Um, what was the most uh, fascinating or just a good time to, to, to read up on. Some of the best books of that era, there's some magnificent um, books about uh, members of the Rat Pack. Nick Tachis wrote the most beautiful one called Dino. Uh, uh, the, it's, like, it's like the Dino, the, the dirty business of dreams or something like that, but it's just so good. Uh, the late Nick Tachis uh, and James Kaplan wrote a couple amazing biographies of Sinatra. Kitty Kelly wrote a pretty, dishy kitty kelly version uh but the some of the most enjoyable ones are the ones by some of like the smaller characters like judith exner uh who uh had an affair with um giancana and others in that era um she wrote a book uh that came out in 1977 and kind of disappeared i'm sure with people pulling strings, mm. but it was catching, kind of catching kill of its day. I mean, it was published, but I think it went straight to paperback and yeah, I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure there was some pressure on networks to not touch it. I'm sure I, there had to have been, cause it's so insane. This book she wrote. Uh, and then George Jacobs, who was a valet of Sinatra's, uh, I, just reading about the era is incredible. Um, there was so much that was interesting. I'll tell you what was most surprising to me was just thinking about race in 19, and there's a lot of this in the book. There's a lot about um, how women are treated in Hollywood. And there's also a lot about um, race in Hollywood because of Sammy Davis Jr. obviously is a, is a character in the book. But first of all, Sinatra was, unbeknownst to me at the time, really progressive on civil rights issues, like in the forties and the fifties. I mean, you and I, I think are roughly the same age. You look younger than me, but I think we're roughly contemporaries. Uh, and I, the Sinatra I knew was kind of bloated with a toupee and he was singing to Ronald and Nancy, Nancy Reagan. That, that's the Reagan, that's the Sinatra. I was a first when I was first aware of Sinatra. And then I became aware of like him through 
people making fun of him, like Joe Piscopo or doing impressions of him on Saturday Night Live. And it wasn't until later that I started like, you know, listening to his music and, and, and the like. But he was very progressive on civil rights issues in the 40s and 50s, like forcing uh, Vegas hotels to integrate, uh, demanding that um, African-American members of the band are, were paid the same. I mean, in today's context, it's not that big a deal, but in 1950, it, it, it was pretty revolutionary. The Kennedys also, one of the other things that was interesting to me um, was that Sammy Davis Jr., I, mean, I never really thought about it, but he, his wife was white and what a, I mean, which was very uncommon in 1960, very uncommon. I mean, Loving versus Virginia, Virginia was 67 or something. The law, the Supreme court case that struck down laws against uh, interracial marriage. I think it was like seven years later, the Kennedys. And I don't know whether John or Robert knew about it, but certainly ambassador Kennedy leaned on the rat back for Sammy Davis Jr. to delay his wedding until after the election. I mean, that's how messed up this world was. So I think just a lot of that stuff, like, you know, it intellectually that like, boy, it was really racist back then. But then like seeing like little examples of even super huge stars like Sammy Davis Jr. were being pressured by the Democratic nominee to delay his interracial uh, marriage. And even then, he wasn't asked to perform at the inaugural ball because he had a white wife. So Sidney Poitier was there with his his black wife. But, you know, so just. It, may, it makes a little bit more sense why Jackie Robinson endorsed Dick Nixon in 1960. <laughs> you know, I, I had this experience reading the book that I would stop every few pages to 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 Google things. Um, right. You know, I, I feel like an interactive version of, of it should be available at some point. But, you know, your protagonists move kind of Zelig like yeah. through just a world chock full of real celebrities, all the names you just mentioned and many, many others. Um, it's a real who's who of 1962. And, and I, I was kind of intrigued to think about like your, your job as a journalist is to unearth truth about powerful people. When you put on your novelist hat, you're also inventing some tales about them. And just tell right. me how you thought about that tension. It is a tension. You're right. And it's one that I struggled with in the first book and the second book, because I'm making stuff up about real people. Um, and I felt uh, in between the first draft and the second draft of the first of the first book, The Hellfire Club, I became a little bit more comfortable with uh, and I made um, Joe McCarthy a bigger character in the book. And if I could do a third draft of it, I would make him an even bigger one. And in fact, in the TV show that we're working on, me and Mark Smith, who wrote The Revenant, I said, make like, I wish I could do a third draft and I'd make Joe McCarthy an even bigger character, um, which is why. And so in the second book, I'm even I'm more comfortable with it. And that's why Sinatra is arguably the, the third biggest character in the book after Charlie and Margaret. You, I, I, you know, I guess the challenge is you're just trying to be you have to just let yourself make stuff up because it's a novel. And you can't just go by transcripts of things that people said. Uh, because then you have no plot, you know, you're, then it's just, um, you know, you're, uh, do you remember, uh, what was the name of the book? Dead, uh, the movie. Do you remember dead men don't wear plaid? You can't yes. do a dead man dead for people who don't know, uh, dead men don't wear plaid is a movie that came out in the eighties and it's Steve Martin as a detective in the thirties or forties. And it's him interacting with real film stars from that time. So he can only he has to use what they did in real movies. To, so I can't do that in a novel and I can have more. I know I have more freedom than that than uh, than Steve Martin did for that. But you try to be true to the idea. You try to be true to the to the essence of the person. You know, you can't have Frank Sinatra like open his shirt. And he's Spider-Man. You can't have. Um, you know, you just you, you want it to ring true. That's all. I mean, like you're creating a universe and there are real people in this universe and you want it to ring true. You don't want to um, you want the reader to believe it. In fact, one of the, the, the what somebody asked me the other day, you know, what is there any is there anybody from that era that I wanted to have in the book uh, as a bigger, you know, in, that I didn't. And there is and it's Marilyn Monroe. She appears a few times in the book. 
This is like towards the end of her life. She dies in 1962, um, but not, not in, the, in my book, but because um, the book ends in May and I think she dies later, I think maybe August or, or September. But she kind of is here and there. She shows up and she's kind of like falling apart because she's really drug addled and, and uh, just really destroyed at that point. Real, a real tragic uh, figure. And I never could figure out a way to get her into the book in a way that didn't feel, even though the book is all kind of gimmicky, it just, I never could, I never could figure out a way to do it that rang true. So that's it. I mean, I just had to rely on my instinct to like make it so people would feel my ambivalence about Sinatra, uh, but also see the good and bad in him and that sort of thing. But like never, it just had to ring, it had to ring right for the world I was creating. You know, sometimes historical fiction, whether it's in printed form or in films, can can kind of end up being the, the received history of a moment or a person, um, yeah. even even though it you know is not a strictly historical work. And I'm like, I can see Alaska from my house, which yeah. <laughs> Sarah Palin never, or I can see Russia from my house, which she never said. And it's probably her best known quote. And she never said it. Absolutely. And, um, you know, in in this book, your Hellfire Club was written further back in in the Trump era when we you know, had already gotten into the world of alternative facts and everything, but probably wasn't quite as obvious just how much of a sort of post truth era we are in. Yeah. Um, and this book more about the demagoguery is what yeah. I mean, there's there's resonance in the first book about Trump, but it's uh, in the in the form of um, Joe McCarthy's demagoguery. But yeah, no, I'm sorry to interrupt. But yes, I agree. Um, well, I, I was just wondering, because in this book, without giving away too much, you know, we have we have the Church of Scientology up to some some uh, not such good things. We we have uh, human trafficking kind of at the center of the book. And um, I'm wondering on kind of both those those topics, you know, given how much the sort of moral panic over human and child trafficking has become such a part of QAnon, for example, did that was that more interesting to explore? Did it make you uneasy at moments when you were exploring that wondering, oh, man, is is Jake Tapper's version of history going to, you know, blot out the sun? Uh, it's more, I think it's more Epstein than QAnon in terms of the, the, the trafficking angles, like in other words, like reality based. Um, and we can't pretend that it's still not a part of the life of some, you know, very wealthy and powerful men that, um, you know, I, look, I don't know what of the allegations against Congressman Matt Gates. I don't know what's true. I don't know what's not true. I don't know what's going to hold up in court, but there, there is certainly been many allegations about a scene in Florida where women are encouraged to come and party and have things paid for. Uh, and that's it's 2021 it's still going on. So I did feel like exploring that was important, uh, especially because, you know, the book was taking place in Hollywood. Um, I wanted Margaret to have her, you know, generally the, the way these books work is I give Charlie kind of like a mystery to solve and Margaret gets one too, or she, Margaret, Margaret has her own mystery. Like they're both, mm-hmm. he's kind of the main protagonist, but she's kind of the hero. So it's like, they have these kind of like joint, you know, uh, parallel adventures. So I wanted how women are treated in Hollywood to be a subtext of, of the book both, you know, Janet Lee and, and Tippi Hedren and, and the like, uh, but also younger, more vulnerable uh, women. And yes, I definitely thought about Epstein, um, which is a real, see, the thing about QAnon is if any of these folks were, as, were I, as far as I can tell, first of, all, first of all, let me just say, there's nothing unrighteous about caring about child sex trafficking or sex trafficking in general. I mean, that's a, it's a horrible major problem in this country all over the world. I don't see any evidence that these people are actually concerned about it. I see them like, like worried about, it's not like they've turned on Matt Gates, right? I mean, like, no, it's, it's a partisan, a partisan filter for sure. 
Yeah, no, I mean, there are a number of, and you can find them, uh, former Trump, and I'm not blaming Trump for it at all, but there are people who you know, have been affiliated with the Trump campaign or the Trump White House or the Republican Party who have been, who've gotten in trouble for child pornography or trafficking or whatever. And I mean, you just have to Google it. It's right there, the rest reports. And I've seen none, I see nothing about QAnon caring about any of that. It's just as a way to traffic in uh, ways to demonize Democrats and the media and Hollywood. Um, but, I, but Epstein was definitely on my mind very much. Let me ask you about, um, in some ways, maybe the highest wire you were on in this book, you invented a Sinatra song, <laughs> um, which yeah. is you know, the title of the book is the title of the song. And it's not in the book. You the, the lyrics are sung and therefore written on the page, intercut with an action scene. Yeah. And. Uh, you know, I don't I don't know how vicious the Sinatra fan base is these days, but I I wondered what you did to sort of feel like you felt pretty sure that these are in the style and the manner of lyrics that Sinatra would have sung. Well, it, um, it was more so the, when I wrote The Outpost, which is a nonfiction book about Afghanistan, uh, there was a scene where. One of the guys and his whole unit were they were driving into Afghanistan, they're driving north in Afghanistan and they were cranking up ACDC. And there was another scene at the end of the book after the big battle where eight of their brothers died. This is all this is all true story where they're singing Johnny Cash songs because one of them played the guitar. This guy um, specialist, Chris Jones. And I had to take out everything except for one line because the attorneys for Little Brown, and I'm sure it's the same for every publishing house, said, you can't quote more than one line or we'll get sued for copyright infringement, period. And then the same happened when I wrote The Hellfire Club and I tried to use songs from the time to set a tone, set a scene, one line. And I, I hate it so much. Music is so such a part of our lives. And you're not quoting the song, you're not playing the song, but you're just, you know, you're quoting a lyric. I think, I think it's really. So this is like frustration over the limits of fair use. Yep. I love it. Entirely. It was like, and in fact, the lawyers called me. There's more than one song in there that's made up, by the way. The um, first of all, thank you for reading the book. Not everybody who does one of these actually reads the book. So I appreciate it. Um, the scene at Disneyland where Sammy Davis Jr. and Peter Lawford sing a wacky song about the Cuban revolution, uh, like a cheesy, like kind of embarrassed, like that I wrote up, that I made up. And then there's another time that Peter Lawford and Charlie are driving to the compound in Rancho Mirage and, a, and there's like a song, a Sinatra song comes on the radio. That's just a paragraph or something, but I made that up too. Yeah, and the lawyers called me up and they're like, Tapper, we've been through this. Now this is the third book. You can't quote more than a line from a song. You have an entire scene with an entire song intricately woven into this action scene at the climax of the book. And I'm like, I wrote the song. It's not a real song. It's not a real Sinatra song. But I, but they, they were, so I was really psyched that I fooled them. And then the, my editors made me put at the end of the book um, to make sure that nobody went mad Googling uh, that, I made, that I wrote it, that I made it up. But it's the theme of the song, the, the theme of the book. The theme of the book is what happens to you when you ally yourself with somebody who is who has worse ethics than you, whether it's the Kennedys allying themselves with the Rat Pack or Sinatra allying himself with the mob or Charlie hanging out with the Rat Pack. What happens to you when that happens? And that's what the song is about. Uh, and. It's also something that we're seeing play out in real time right now with the Republican Party. They danced with the devil, metaphorically, Donald Trump, to get their judges and their tax cuts and whatever they wanted. And now we see how he has altered them. And I mean, I know people who knew Elise Stefanik when she worked at the Bush White House, and they do not recognize this person. So... I mean, I think there, that wasn't intentional at the time, but, but when I wrote the book about what happens to you when you ally yourself, but it's, I think it's kind of resonant right now. 
Um, you and I both got our start, or more or less, at the same alternative weekly, um, Washington yeah. City Paper. We were there at slightly different times. I'm were wondering. Under Jack Schaefer. When were you? I, was, I had. A, I had a. I split my time between Jack Schaefer and David Carr. So I. Okay. I was doubly blessed. Um, oh, that's great. I'm. I'm wondering what how that time helped inform the rest of your career. Well, David Carr was an incredible editor. And if I'd known how little time we were going to get with him, I probably would have taken advantage of it more. Um, he is the one that convinced me I was writing freelance. I was working in public relations because it paid better. And I was, you know, this is in my twenties when I was, so I was doing PR and kind of figuring out what I wanted to do with my life. And I started doing freelance journalism. And then he took me to lunch to that French restaurant in Adams Morgan that he loved. I forget the name of it, but you know what I'm talking about. And Track, uh, yeah. yeah, it was the first time I ever saw snails, uh, uh, not in a garden. And um, he convinced me to quit my job and take a huge pay cut and become a journalist. Join, you know, hop on his pirate ship. And so that was huge. And then, I mean, I remember so many things and I, w I wish I could go back in time and yell at my younger self to take advantage more of being next to him, being near him. Uh, but he was just a interesting guy, critical thinker. I always thought it was so amazing how he, one of the things he did was he wrote the, the press column while being this amazing editor, he wrote the press column and he would, take on the Washington Post in these, in just like in this fearless way, because like every writer in Washington wanted to work for the Washington Post, everyone. And Carr was like crapping all over them <laughs> righteously with, 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 with in, in like the best way possible, which is like not with opinion, with, in, with reported analysis, but just like the facts were what drove it. And he was just fearless. And uh, I wish I wish he's one of the people that I wish I could see. I wish he, they, the world is so deprived of his voice, um, not covering the era we're in. He, he'd be, obviously, he went on to become the media writer for The New York Times. I would just love to see him making sense of our media now, making sense of Trump world. When did he die in 2014, 2015? something yeah. yeah so and uh yeah but i mean it was just it was very um influential because it's so funny i know that the perception of me and anyone who works for cnn is that we're mainstream corporate blah 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 but like i feel like a city paper i feel like an alternative weekly guy you know and like yeah i realize i'm working within the confines of like commercial television commercial news but like my roots are city paper and i'm really proud of it you know it's um i think we're we're both bereft that alt weeklies um you know have really kind of taken it on the chin the past mm -hmm. couple of decades or you know most of them have closed the ones that are left are um mostly not where they used to be and 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 honestly that's true of a lot of journalism yeah. And I'm wondering what part of it worries you the most? Well, I mean, the stuff that David Simon talks about that who is going to go to the Baltimore city council meetings, because it's not going to be CNN. It's not going to be the New York times. It's not going to be mother Jones. Like who's going to do it. Like it has to be the Baltimore sun or the Baltimore city paper. It has to be, um, that terrifies me because the truth of the matter is the politicians in Washington are probably less crooked than as, as a general rule than the ones in state capitals and cities and counties all over the country, just because there's so much oversight uh, by the press and by the house. Now that doesn't mean, that there isn't a lot of corruption and, and generally speaking, uh, it's cliche at this point to say, but the scandal in Washington is always what's legal, not what's illegal. But 
I worry about like what's going on in Harrisburg, you know, what's going on in Trenton. Um, is anybody covering it? Uh, are enough people covering it? So that's, but you know, it's not just, it's not just the, the local newspapers and um, the local free weeklies. It's local television stations too. Um, I mean, some of them are still in the fight. I just saw a great report out of Seattle of uh, some really messed up treatment of foster kid, foster kids um, by the, the, the service there, the, the foster service in, in Washington state. But like all, all of these institutions are, are holding on, you know, by a thread and, you know, that's by intention. I mean, that's what, that's what politicians and corporate America want to have happen. Yeah. And I think it's also that, you know, things like CNN and, and the New York Times rely either either on the talent pool that comes up through those places or the file footage. I mean, you know, it, or whatever, like the reporting that's done locally. Uh, you may not live in that location, but if it's important enough, it gets to the national news, but not if it's never told. Yeah. And I will say, especially if anybody is listening um, when it comes to um, Mother Jones or any other organization, if you think that you have a story that is big that you've broken for your local outlet, hit me up on Twitter or social media. I will, you know, we will, we will go in, we will give you the credit. I just did it today for reveal, which is this nonprofit, uh, great, uh, news organization that broke this horrifying story. They have this video of a sheriff's deputy in Texas. That was a great story. Tasing a 15 year old migrant a year ago, Somehow the video didn't come out till this week and the investigation by the sheriff's office didn't start until last month, but Reveal did it. And, you know, we gave them the credit. Their stamp was all over the video. Like we'll bring attention to it if it's a, if it's a big enough story. And, and I mentioned some other local news coverage uh, on my show today from Kansas and from Washington. And like, I, I am, it's probably a manifestation of coming up from city paper and salon.com and seeing people take my scoops and not give credit that I try to be assiduous with my crediting uh, if somebody breaks a story. And I will continue to do that. Um, but we need that. I mean, we need, I mean, I'm not gonna, yeah. I mean, we need great investigative journalists all over. You know, every profile that I've, I've read about you um, has described you as being very confident from a young age. And um, I think you know me well enough to know that I'm, I have plenty of insecurities. <laughs> well, I, I would say that what do you think for you, at least in your public, um, your public uh, persona, which came first, the confidence or the accomplishments? Um, like, how did you gain confidence? And what would you say to young journalists who are maybe a different gender or a different race? what would your advice be to, to kind of seize that confidence? First of all, I'm plenty insecure. I mean, you know, like any other human being on the planet. Um, but that said, I think one of the things, and this is, I say this to young people constantly because I don't think anybody prepared me. So I want young people to know this and young people who are any color, any race, any gender identification, any whatever, any, any uh, ethnicity, especially in journalism, but in anything, there is a lot more rejection out there than you have been raised to believe there is in life. Like if you're a kid and then you're a high schooler and then you're a college kid, there is some rejection here and there. Maybe you didn't get the part you wanted in the school play, or maybe the boy you liked or the girl you liked didn't like you back or whatever. You didn't get into the fraternity you wanted, but generally speaking, you get a lot of what you want. And there are like, there's a cocoon around you. There are like people, there are people in college whose job it is to like, your resident advisors, right? Who their job is to make sure that you're doing okay. Right. Um, but then you go into the, into the real world and it is, it can, it can't, for me, at least it was harsh because it's not like it, it's, and it's tough not to take it personally, but like, it's not, it's just, it's just a different world and people just need to be ready to be rejected. 
and not take it personally. And I know it's easy to say it, but you just have to believe me that every successful person you see in journalism, everyone, and I'm friends with a lot of people in journalism, you know, from print to radio to TV, whatever. Every one of us has been rejected so many times <laughs> by so many people, um, like professionally and maybe personally too. And, uh, but I mean, professionally, uh, when I was a freelancer, I mean, submitting story. And this is like, and you know, I'm faxing story ideas to people so much rejection. Um, and you just have to, this is just part of it. It's just part of it. And you just have to think of it like you're going to make it. it and it's going to, you know, and nothing like, there are going to be people who get like everything they want and, and whatever. It just, the world lies prostrate at their feet. But generally speaking, it's, uh, it's, it's much more of a struggle and that's just how it is. And I just think people should just be prepared for it. I think there has probably never been a better time to be a woman journalist or a journalist that's who's, who's, who's black or Latino or Asian that I'm not saying that it's easy or, or I'm, I'm, it's, it's still much easier to be a white male journalist. Don't get me wrong, but people are at least now like aware that, you know, it's part of the conversation in a way that it, that it wasn't when I was coming up. So don't let that discourage you. Um, there will be, there will be, um, there's always going to be uh, obstacles, but if you want to be a journalist or if you want to be whatever you want to be, you can be it. What, um, what part of your job do you enjoy the most? The truth of the matter is I love doing my show. I love doing the lead and I love doing state of the union, uh, which I do now uh, twice a month. And Dana Bash is my co-anchor. She does the other two times. I love it. I love like, I love having the, like we do. I feel like we do a really good show. Like we do, a, we cover news from all over the world. I love not having to cover whatever you think of Trump. And I'm not saying he should have been elected or reelected or whatever, but like him not being in the white house and not like doing crazy tweets or having like everybody just like constantly reacting to the disrupting he's doing um, means that like, I now have time in my show to do a piece about foster care in America or to do a piece with somebody about the elections in Nicaragua or, you know, we have these amazing journalists like uh, Clarissa Ward and Nima Albagger. And I love bringing their stories to air. I love Nima goes to Ethiopia uh, in the Tigray region. And I love that. Uh, and I'm proud of that. I feel like a lot of people talk about like uh, a lot of people talk about what journalism should be and what, how can, you know, and I feel like I'm not doing, I'm not saying like, like I'm, I'm not, a, you know, I'm our show is perfect or I'm perfect or anything like that. I'm proud of the fact that we're doing stories from Ethiopia. You know, is, is it, is it, I mean, that's an entire show, but of the sort of particular pieces, do you, do you love grilling someone? Do you love the sort of research process leading up to a great segment? Is there a part that particularly charges you about the making of any, any one show? I mean, when I have a good interview with somebody, like a good tough interview with somebody, it's, it's, uh, it's fun. I like doing like Stephen Miller, perhaps uh, that was a sort of a, <laughs> that was a classic. That, was, that one. was a long time ago. I, I, I feel like but that wasn't pleasant. I would have really honestly preferred him to have been just like a normal human being and like answer my questions, but he was performing for his audience of one. I'm actually, I, I haven't watched it. Uh, um, I did fresh air a few years ago and they played me a chunk of the interview and I couldn't believe in retrospect how patient I was with him. Like I really let him babble for a long time. Like, I guess it was 2017 or 2018. Like my tolerance 
changed a lot. I like calling out. I really do like calling out the lies. I do like it. I mean, I would, I would prefer that they didn't do it, but I do like calling it out because I think that we're in a, I worry about our democracy. Uh, I worry in a way I worry more than it now than I did before because um, it's not that it was out of character for Trump, what he did, but there was always the belief that he could be reined in. And I think that, that Jared Kushner was telling Mitch McConnell, just wait till December, just wait till the electors meet, then he'll drop it. And he didn't, obviously. So I do feel like their democracy is at risk, maybe even in a greater way than it was before. You know, I, I think people don't really fully understand how close we came to the election being stolen. Well, and how they're setting up to enshrine the ability to do it again. Uh, you well, know, that's what I'm worried about, because now they are changing laws in states like Georgia to make it so it will be easier for a state legislature to overturn the will of a secretary of state whose job it is, like Brad Raffensperger, who is a very conservative Christian evangelical Republican who abided by the law and stuck to the facts and now may well not be reelected. He might not, he might be primary. He might lose his primary. Um, and I think that's going to happen in a few places. I, I think people, I don't know if people really fully understand that like, 15, 20 different people in the job in specific places, Philadelphia city council and, you know, Michigan board of Maricopa, electors, yeah. Maricopa County, like all of them Republican, by the way, all of these people I'm talking about, the governor, governor Kemp, very unlikely heroes, right? Governor Ducey. I think people don't fully understand necessarily that if like 15, 20 different people were in those positions, the election would have been stolen. And I don't know what would have happened. I mean, would there have been a, another civil war? I mean, what would have happened? Well, I, what, I mean, let me ask you what what was happening at the network when that was going on? I mean, journalists covering it were aware of of the peril that it was coming down to a very. I mean, we were calling it as we were we were laying it straight as it was during that time saying it. I don't know what they were saying it on, on other networks. Um. But, you know, but we were just saying what was happening. Uh, but I don't know. I, I'm afraid of what's going to happen next time. I mean, I was afraid before, but if Trump and the MAGA forces literally steal an election, and I think just to be clear on what we're talking about, we're talking about the, the theory goes um, whoever the Democratic nominee is, Biden or Harris or whoever, wins the popular vote by 10 million, wins the electoral vote by a few states. And then those states, Georgia, Arizona, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Michigan, the laws have been changed or whatever. I guess that won't happen in Michigan as long as there's a Democratic governor, but in certain other places, who knows? And there's a, and there are disputes. We have like the election of 1876 where there's two different slates of electors. This happened before, right? Right. right. It happened in 1876. And uh, anyway, I mean, I don't know what's going to happen. And and if Kevin and if um, McCarthy is the Speaker of the House, I mean, what Liz Cheney is saying is he won't do the right thing. I mean, she doesn't think, say it like that. I asked her what would what would McCarthy have done had he been speaker in January 2021? What would he have done? Would he have upheld the law and the Constitution? And she said, I think you can only judge somebody by his actions. And I said, well, his actions are he supported the big lie. And she said, I mean, yeah, I, I think that that's what's so interesting. I mean, you mentioned a while ago that that, uh, you know, Jared was telling Mitch McConnell, like, he'll let it go. Don't worry. I, I don't know what would lead Jared or anybody else to have believed that at, at that point. I don't put much credence in, credence in uh, Jared's honesty, but um, now 
he wasn't even there, but he was running around brokering. Yeah, he, was, he was solving Middle East peace, you know, so he did accomplish something, but, he, but he's, but he's deluded if he thinks that's going to be in the first paragraph of his obituary. I mean, you know, hopefully which won't be written for a long, long time, but like, that's not the lead. But, but the, I think what's interesting about this moment is that yes, Trump still holds sway and they're all worried about being primaried and mean tweets or mean, you know, email missives, whatever tool he's using at his disposal now that he's killed his failing blog, but they're doing it nonetheless. It's not, yeah, you know, it's maybe at his behest, but in a much more attenuated way. So there's not, there's not this sort of, oh, I didn't see that tweet. Oh, I don't know what he's doing. I don't really believe him, you know, and I think that's a scary new moment for the country that I, I am not sure people fully understand either that this yeah. is, this has become an ideology of maintaining power at kind of all costs. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think Liz Cheney, um, I mean, you just have to look at Liz Cheney who is somebody I'm sure that you agree with nothing. I would agree with her about almost nothing, but you just have to look at what she did. And like this whole idea, I mean, it's such a joke when the MAGA people say like Liz Cheney did that to be popular at cocktail parties or whatever. What cocktail parties? <laughs> like, who's having cocktail parties? And even then when there were cocktail parties, I never saw Liz Cheney at a cocktail party. I mean, I don't go to many of them anyway, but like, it's all such nonsense. There's no upside for Liz Cheney other than she can sleep at night. That's it. Like she might lose her house seat. Her state is mad at her. It's the bit most uh, percentage wise, the most Trump supporting state in the country. She wants to be president. I can't see that happening anytime in the least in the next decade or two. I mean, Forget being. Yeah, I'm, not, I'm not sure that ever would have happened, to be honest. But yes, I, I mean, it, I can't imagine any of these people becoming president until all of a sudden they're president. So, yeah, I mean, I guess you, I get your point. I mean, I, my, my only point is just like. She threw I mean, she didn't throw it away, but like she risked it all because she's saying they're lying. They've been lying. It caused the insurrection. They're going to try to do it again. This is a clear and present danger to the nation. She didn't go on David Axelrod's podcast because she and David Axelrod are friends. She's trying to get the word out. I mean, I, you know, I, I just, I, I just think it is a, I admire what she's done, what she's doing. There are a few members of Congress like this, Mitt Romney, uh, Congressman Meyer, Congressman Kinzinger, but it's very few governor Hogan, you know, there are a few, there are a few people here and there, but it's, very few and far between. It's not just mean tweets though, right? And it's not even just their jobs because Trump will primary them. He's gonna go after Lisa Murkowski, you know, et cetera, et cetera. It's, um, I mean, Liz Cheney said a bunch of the people that voted against impeachment did so because they were getting death threats and they were afraid that if they voted to impeach that they could be killed. Yeah. This um, I, I've been weaving in questions from the audience all along, but I think this is a good one to end on from from somebody in the audience, um, you know, who's basically asking a question. I'm sure you get a lot and I get a lot. But um, with everything that's with our country being so divided politically, what gives you hope that we could come closer together or are you in a sort of ebb of hope at the moment? I'm never without hope for this country. Um, and other countries have their problems too. It's not like I look at any other country and say, well, they've got it figured out. Maybe New Zealand, uh, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> I've never been to New Zealand. It's easier to control a pandemic when you're an island though. Um, but they have their problems too. Remember they had that horrible massacre at a, at a mosque, right? In New Zealand. So they're, they're, yeah. they've, got, they've got their problems too. Um, 
I'm never without hope. Uh, I think that, you know, it's just a time for people to, it's a time for politicians to really think about what's more important, their own individual pursuit of power or the country. And uh, I'm not seeing enough people pick the country, but I do see some. And I think about Peter Meyer, who's new freshman congressman from Michigan, very conservative, served in Iraq. Um, I think he did some NGO work in Afghanistan. And this is his first six months in Congress. And he's, you know, voted for the January 6th commission, voted to impeach Trump based on um, the insurrection, taking some very bold stands. And, you know, I do find some comfort that there are people like him, like Liz Cheney, uh, taking these stands. But I think that people in media, I think, I'm obviously not talking about you, but, but I think that the more people in media need to look, I, I'm not a liberal Democrat. I'm not like advocating that Joe Biden be reelected. I mean, I just think, I think it's important that these very nefarious lies be called out, you know, um, they're really horrible. I mean, you see, I had the Capitol police, I'm sorry, the metropolitan police officer, Fanon on my show, he's, he's a Republican, you know, he's a cop. He just can't believe this. And I just think that we need to speak for him. People like us in the media need to speak for him and just call things as they are. Uh, I saw something in Politico the other day that described to, you know, um, McCarthy and uh, Scalise and Stefanik as, you know, uh, standing by Trump's election fraud claims. Is that what they're doing? Right. Or spreading is that, them. Is that, I mean, but are they just election fraud claims? Right. Election fraud beliefs? Is that what they are? Election fraud beliefs? It's a lie. It's a lie. We have to call it out. I mean, anyway. So I have some hope, but I, but I also hope that other people get with the program a little bit more. Well, Jake, I want to um, thank you very much um, again to our audience. Probably needs no real introduction or, or uh, exit statement, but thanks to Jake Tapper, CNN anchor and author of The Devil May Dance, um, which we encourage you to pick up at your local bookstore, which you can go back to now, almost everywhere. Yeah. Um, and if you'd like to watch more virtual programs or support the Commonwealth Club, please again visit commonwealthclub.org. I'm Clara Jeffrey. Thank you, everyone. Take care um, and take care to you, Jake. Thank you so much. And you did a wonderful job. Thanks for reading the book and thanks for being a, a great moderator that asked great questions. Thank you.